Thank you for having us. I'm Peter Dugas. I am the co-chair of the Portland chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Citizens Climate Lobby is a national, international organization of a whole, almost 200,000 volunteers. We have over 195,000 volunteers. And um, we are laser focused on creating the political will for bipartisan climate solutions on a national scale. Um, we are very active in Maine and there's, as I'll get into in a second, we're gonna have a lot of reasons to be both hopeful and to be working very hard to uh, increase the political will for uh, this solution. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen. There's two components of what I'm gonna be talking about, but what I really wanna share uh, this screen, if that's okay. Um, we have a, there's everyone has a personal story about climate change and as Mainers, there's, we have a lot to lose. Um, my personal story talks about when Mai was first married, I kind of married into a family that had a generations long tradition of shelling Maine shrimp um, on my mother-in-law's birthday, which was January 1, when it's the middle of Maine shrimp season, or at least it was. Um, and taking that shrimp and buying it at half the cost when you buy it wholesale with the, sh with the shells and you shell it and put them in baggies in the freezer. And it was, my daughter was part of that tradition and we had three generations of Maine women doing it. So it was like a Norman Rockwell Christmas card. Um, but over time, of course, that, uh, you know, that is sh was shut down because of the warming of Maine's ocean waters. And you think, you know, causes you to think how many millennia those shrimp were in there uh, in the Gulf of Maine. And we know Gulf of Maine is warming faster than almost any other body of water in the, in the world. And, um, you know, the good news is you can still get Maine shrimp. The bad news is you have to go to Newfoundland, like really far north to get them. And we can think about, it doesn't take too much imagination to understand what's going to happen to lobster and winter recreation and our temperate summers and blueberry harvest and all, you know, there's nothing quintessentially Maine that's not vulnerable to climate change. Um, I did climate change research as an undergraduate uh, data entry stuff 25 years ago, 20 years ago, and, and it's been um, on my mind ever since and only increased. So I'll quickly go through, we know that over the past 800,000 years of, uh, we've never had so much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, and there's more than a dozen robust, robust lines of um, of evidence showing that our car carbon emissions are creating a problem um, and, and disrupting the balance between radiation coming from the sun and our ability to maintain a temperate climate. It's increasing the, the temperatures on the, on the global scale. Um, and a lot of that is coming from the emissions of CO2, which come from the industrial revolution. You can see here on a graph of coal, oil, land use, natural gas, that kind of stuff. So, there's a lot of terrible things that'll happen. I'm going through this very quickly because I don't want to uh, emphasize, you know, these are maps of projections of what's already happening to the Gulf Coast and what could happen in the near future as we lose more coastal cities and the infrastructure and the tremendous costs to, uh, to our, to, uh, you know, the, the world's financial systems, never mind humanitarian crises like drought, wildfires, uh, floods and that sort of thing. So I'm actually going to switch over now to uh, talk about an online tool that's developed by MIT called En-ROADS, which with all the talk about the climate crisis and so many competing ideas about how what means would be best to, to, to address the problem and to effectively and equitably transfer the world's economy to a way that's not poisoning the atmosphere anymore, um, there's, we, we need a third party tool and that's what MIT developed. Their previous products, which are still available called Sea roads which was actually a, a, a version that was used to, for successful negotiations of the 2015 Paris Protocol negotiations, where scientists um, needed from different world communities basically could talk about where they needed to pledge to keep their greenhouse gas emissions in order to avoid disaster. Um, and without that tool, apparently, according to people on the ground, uh, those negotiations would not have been as successful as they were in creating a, at least an infrastructure uh, framework for, for participation on a global scale. The, this new model, uh, En-ROADS, is free to use. You just go to this website, en-roads, 
Um, and you can check out, you know, there's a lot of background and material. You can take the same eight week course I did, which is free to, just as it is to use the program to be qualified to hold, um, to, to do demonstrations of it. And basically it's policy driven, it's economics driven. Um, very quickly, what's happening here is on the right, I'm looking at global temperature increases on the global scale from where we were 20 years ago till now, so the past 20 years from 0 0.67 degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, pre-industrial meaning you know 1800 before the internal combustion engine, to now where we're at 1.1 degrees. And you know scientists are saying we have to stay below 1.5 to kind of keep certain ecosystems in balance, which means uh, ocean reefs and keeping uh, rising to, um, ocean uh, sea level rise to a certain degree. And then if it's a, as it looks like we're gonna blow past that, uh, they say two degrees is really, you know, we would still sacrifice a lot past 1.5, but two degrees is really a kind of existential crisis for humanity where um, we're talking about feedback loops that we can no longer control. Um, and then it's kind of a runaway system that our time to, to, to do something about it has passed. Um, so this is the projections of where we're going in the next 80 years to the end of the century. And this is where our energy sources are coming from. So the energy sources each create, so creating varying degrees of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. But we, we can see black is coal, the dirtiest of fuels um, and most plentiful. Um, oil is red natural gas is blue, renewables is green, bioenergy is pink, uh, nuclear is light blue, and then net zero, which is um, kind of stays at zero, but it's, it's basically a catch-all category for in case we discover some kind of new energy in the next 80 years that changes everything, whether that be nuclear fusion, which is eluded scientists, or we discover vibranium or you know the flux capacitor or something like that from some kind of science fiction. Um, and then all of these levers you can see here are a way of manipulating policy. So when I'm actually adjusting renewables, I'm not talking about actually pushing, you know, creating new renewables, I'm actually just incentivizing it. So for each of these categories, all of the different forms of energy, we also have how to rework our transportation systems on a global scale, not just cars, but also trains, planes, automobiles, all this stuff, um, energy efficiency and electrification of those. Uh, energy efficiency and electrification of our buildings, um, and then growth in population and economic growth as much as we can um, adjust for that. Land management through either the rate at which we're cutting down the world's forests or land management that creates methane and other kinds of secondary greenhouse gases besides carbon dioxide, and then carbon removal, either through natural means, planting trees and forests, or technological. Uh, which is like contraptions that might suck carbon out of the atmosphere. So here in Maine, we know that most of our um, most of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from from our tailpipes. So I could move here. Each one of these, by the way, I can check out this three dot system and see do a, a more detailed approach um, and look into for information. But I'm just going to go quickly through this and give you a cursory explanation of each of these and see what it's like. So. We want to get below two degrees. And if we, on a global scale, kind of incentivize people moving away from internal combustion engines in their car to electric vehicles, so Nissan Leafs, Priuses, um, whatever it might be, Teslas, we can grab this and just move this all the way over. And we can see um, that good things do happen. We get renewables going up. Uh, we also see that the temperature got whittled down by a tenth of a degree, which is not anything we need. Uh, well, it actually, sorry, it's it's plenty, but it's great, but it's not nearly enough. I should have said. Um, but the and the explanation for that is if you look at the black line, we can move this all the way over, and you can see that yes, gas goes down, so renewable goes up, but coal kind of goes up a little bit as well, and that's probably the reason you know it's counterintuitive around the United States because we are thinking about coal as uh, as diminishing and it's the amount it, of it, uh, supplies our power but that's not uh, the case worldwide in fact when Australia was on its record-breaking wildfires last year 
um, their number one export was still coal, which is the dirtiest of fossil fuels. So when we only address the electrification of our vehicles, we're actually in, could be on a global scale incentivizing the more coal pollution. We could also go to other ideas like renewables, highly incentivizing renewables. And if I just grab this and slide it over, you can see that renewables, yes, is sub we're subsidized. We're giving people tax breaks or other kinds of economic mechanisms. And it's great that those are going up. Does shave off a little bit of our projected temperature increases, but we're still far away from two and 1.5. And again, that's because uh, an economic argument, this is a very sophisticated model that uses over 16 hundred different com complementary equations and if we're driving policy by to re create renewable incentives you can use the thought experiment economically about well we are now going to spend all you know make renewables that much cheaper what's going to happen to coal well coal is going to going to people are going to move away from coal which is going to make that product uh, have a lot more, a lot less demand, which is going to make the prices go down. So it has a rebound effect and you can see it goes down for a bit and then kind of starts leveling off and then coming back up later on the century. So even with re incentivizing renewables, green energy, um, we still get a, a rebound effect because we're not doing en enough to mitigate the amount of other carbon dioxide emissions. Republicans have been getting to talk about, they've been slow to talk about climate change and um, but the good news is that they're talking more and more about it. You may, some of the audience may have heard some things about their offering ideas about planting a trillion trees, which is a great idea. Um, you can model that. Again, I can show you a deep dive, but I'll just do the quick version and slide this all the way over. And you might, as you might imagine, sources of energy doesn't change because we're not addressing that at all. We're just talking about sucking carbon away um, and it whittles down a 10th of a degree from 3.6 to 3.5. So uh, there's two big takeaways from this model and as far as I see it. One is there's no, uh, there are no uh, silver bullets. There's only silver buckshot. We need a combination of things. We're, we're past the time where we could just address this with one or two different things. Um, however, the folks at Citizens Climate Lobby are very encouraged by the findings that this shows, which is um, they have been for over a dozen years now, been asking, whittling away at the political will of using normal democratic lobbying from volunteer lobbyists to ask uh, the United States and other countries to bring about carbon pricing. The idea is, you know, a gradually increasing price on carbon. There's a number of different bills uh, that are uh, out there that price carbon. And here's a little graph that shows you you don't hear very much about these, but these seven different bills, some of them are Democrat only, some of them are three of the four of them are bipartisan. Um, and we're going to concentrate on this one here, which is the uh, representative Deutsch and, and Rooney bipartisan team um, talked about, which is putting a $15 uh, price on carbon to start with. And that is applied at the point source of, you know, so the, the refinery, the oil refinery, the fracking site, the coal mine, and um, that money equates, when it goes through the system, is about 12 cents on a gallon of gas. So we're already used to that kind of fluctuations or, or you know, those kinds of price fluctuations. Um, and we're going to say that it's, let's be bullish and say that it gets implemented next year. And it goes up every year, starting in the first year by 10 bucks a year. So over the course of the next 80 years, it's going to go up to 80 years times 10 bucks a year is 800 plus the initial 15, which is 815 bucks. And that's conservative. That's actually the lowest it could be. There's language in the bill that make it, if we don't hit certain earmarks, it'll go up to you know $1,500 a year, a little bit steeper. But this is conservatively speaking, it goes up at this rate, a nice linear graph where it gets more and more expensive per ton of carbon emitted. And you can see that although it doesn't bring us down to two degrees, it does more than any other single policy. In fact, it does more than twice any other single policy. And at this point, we can look at the model and we can say, well, let's take a look at where at the, um, the greenhouse gases. Okay, so I'll go back and just show you what this is like with business as usual, charcoal gray is the carbon dioxide, which we're most concerned about because it's the most plentiful greenhouse gas. 
biggest source of our problems. And this is it with a carbon price. You can see by the end of the century, carbon dioxide is no longer the greatest contributor with this carbon price. It's now methane. So I can then address methane by uh, taking better care of the leaks in my, in my pipelines and land use and that kind of thing. And then I can say, okay, now we're actually almost at that magic number of two degrees now. If I, at that point, talk about, well, let's slow down the rate at which we're, we're cutting our forest down, maybe uh, planting some trees as the, as the Republican group has been talking about, uh, technological, we bioengineer some algae or something that will suck up carbon or perhaps those contraptions and that we're working on in, in Switzerland will work. So we can see that it is possible and this is before we're actually getting to business and energy use, and um, we can we can actually get to that 1.5. But this, these, so the two takeaways are: there's no silver bullet, but the biggest factor is in gradually increasing price on carbon. Um, now, there's a problem with that. If we just put that price of carbon into the system, that's tremendously regressive, meaning economically speaking, it hurts the poor. So each one of these bills uses a different uh, mechanism, but they, they, each one of these bills requires that that money that's brought in is returned to each individual taxpayer. Um, and uh, there's a means for doing this, and there's a lot of economic argument for it, which I'll get into, but these are all those bills and the rate at which we've been concentrating on this first column because it has the most co-sponsors. It has 85 co-sponsors currently in the House. There briefly was a Senate companion bill and we're hoping in the new Senate there will be um, one as well. Um, this bill is this one here, the second steepest increase in the price of carbon. Uh, oh, second only to the Senate Coons, Senator Coons' bill, which is a Democratic only bill. We want something that's bipartisan so that it can be robust enough to withstand the changing political, you know, whoever's in, in power at the time. And you can see the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions are right down here, um, which it's sec again, second um, most effective in reducing greenhouse gas emissions only to the Senator Coons bill. So again, how it works, effective, good for the people, good for the economy and revenue neutral, meaning that it doesn't increase the size of government, which is important in order to get Republican support. Um, and we need Republican support in order for it to survive more than two years when, you know, if Democrats have a sweep and take the Senate, uh, then, um, you know, how long that lasts, if we have something that's only gonna last for a couple of years till the midterm elections and people don't vote, then, um, then what good is that? We need something that's gonna withstand the change in political climate. Um, so how it works, again, you put a, a the first, Tenant of the three is you put a fee on the fossil fuel source, and the uh, we IRS or sorry the, the the federal government already keeps track of what the equivalent carbon emissions are for each one of these sources for coal, carbon, uh, coal, uh, oil, and natural gas. All of that money, the net 100% net revenue, is returned in an equal dividend check to each man, woman, and child. If you are under 18, you get half credit. So the parents of those people get a half credit for that. There's all kinds of independent analysis, which you could check out online to show what this does, but tremendously helpful in saving lives. Over the first decade, it's predicted to save about 400,000 lives um, and reduce them, and that's mostly from affiliated respiratory diseases uh, like you know, asthma and other things that are affiliated with the emissions from burning coal and, and other uh, fossil fuels. 40% emi uh, emissions reductions in the first 12 years, uh, and every year after that getting better. The better way of saying that I feel like is it exceeds our Paris Protocol goals within the first eight years. And then after eight years, it does that much better. Uh, and it continues until we are at 10% of 1990 CO2 levels, at which point we'll be happy to assault the existential threat of climate change. Um, what that money returned back to folks as an equal dividend check means that the typical family of four will see a net gain of about $4,400. Um, and uh, that in turn will spur the economy, creating about 2.1 million jobs in the last projections over the, past ten, in the, over the next 10 years after implementation. Um, and that's not just in green industry jobs like building windmills and solar farms, it's also 
just the fact that that dividend check returned to every taxpayer will give them some more money in their pockets so that they can spur the local economy where they live. Um, very briefly, this is a this shows where how that per, that money returned to folks projects to across the income level. So this is the poorest 10% on this bar graph, uh, and they do the best, uh, most likely because they have the uh, least carbon, the smallest carbon footprint because they have the least means to do so, and um, they tremendously benefit from that dividend. And everybody does marginally well or is a, you know wins on this until someplace in this between the 60 and 70th percentile and the top 30 percent in cow uh, on average they will um they will be paying a bit in uh for almost for most of them it's less than two percent of their income level and remember that these are the folks who should be incentivized to decarbonize their lifestyle so and then you you know the top 10 percent and then you break down that top 10 percent into this level these folks, uh, another way of seeing that same bar graph is here, where we're talking about direct energy costs in blue, uh, indirect energy costs, which is like embedded stuff. So like the carbon that's in your, uh, you know, in the food you, uh, but the, the carbon cost, quote unquote, or uh, the, the footprint to the food you eat, the drinks you buy, the products you purchase, services, all that stuff has some sort of embedded carbon um, to the manufacturing or supply of it. So these are where those fees were come from at the bottom quintile, the bottom 20%. And their dividend check exceeds that all the way up to you know, at the top level, even though this looks like a big difference between what their dividend check would be, this because the, the dividend check is taxable, it's got a different level. Um, but it actually amounts to over a course of a year, less than 2% for almost everybody in that top level. And there's gonna be anomalies, rich people who have switched to they have the best means of switching to being carbon winners. Um, it creates a positive economic feedback loop for that. So um, I'm going to skip this bar graph because I think it says the same thing. But basically, it's most of your, most of our carbon costs are embedded. We think of it as carbon fees is affecting our gas for our cars or for heating oil if we're on or you know whatever you're using to heat your house or buy your electricity. But for every income level, most of it is in the embedded costs, uh, the embedded carbon footprint, which means that even if I take that dividend check and foolishly spend it on more gas consumption or carbon fuels, it will just, uh, you know, that will, I still will be reducing my carbon footprint because most of, you know, the sub companies surrounding me are allowing me to, um, you know, they're, they're much more sensitive to slight price fluctuations. So they're gonna be highly incentivized to decarbonize their production lines and their service lines before it gets to me. So it's really about changing industry more than individual, although individual consumers will obviously change their consumption habits. Where has this worked? Um, the easy answer is everywhere it's been tried. Um, our favorite example is one of the older examples, um, about 12 years ago, British Columbia, up as part of a Canadian effort for all the provinces of Canada to experiment and see how they could best reduce their carbon emissions, um, implemented just this almost to, to the letter, this, this policy, where they had a gradually increasing price on carbon and they returned all of them, the, that money back to, as, a, as, a, as an equal dividend check back to Cana British Canadians. Um, it is popular because most people are winners on that dividend check um, and they uh, have reduced their carbon emissions um, be almost twice as much as the Canadian average for the first few years um, and at the same time their economy has outpaced the Canadian average so decoupling the old myth that we need carbon emissions for the economy to grow British Columbia, which is actually a fossil fuel state. I mean, it's not Alberta in its tar sands, but it, they do have some extraction. Um, of they, they do have some reliance on carbon, uh, carbon uh, fossil fuel uh, productions. They actually have outpaced the Canadian average. Um, this is a map of the world with all the countries that uh, participate in carbon pricing, either regionally, domestically, or on the brink of doing this. So, you know, China and India, the people that people point to, well, they, why, are, why should the United States do anything about this? 
if they're not, um, they are to some level pricing their carbon as already. And in fact, the, uh, the EU just announced um, in late 2020 that they will be charging a border adjustment fee on products imported into the EU, which is, I believe, our, after China and Canada, our third biggest trading partner, I'm not sure, but they will be charging those, those tariffs on incoming um, products that do not have an equivalent carbon price. So basically, the United States is 80% of our trading partners already participate in some sort of carbon pricing. Um, and we just have to get our act together uh, in order to be avoided like in some kind of, you know, a tariff war with, with the EU. Well, there's nothing we could do in retaliation because the rest, most of the trade in, in the world is done with partners that have, um, that have a carbon market. Um, so, you know, we share this distinction of not pricing our carbon with Russia, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, um, it's, uh, you know, and those countries are, are going to be incentivized to join the club. When explained to Democrats, uh, they, uh, carbon fee and dividend, this idea has 80% support, very high support. Uh, and the reason when we were, have been meeting with our national representatives here in Maine, we're talking about Senators King Collins, Representatives Golden and Pingree, um, we have found that Republicans are talking to us more and more. Republicans actually under the age of 40, 75% of them support carbon fee and dividend because it does rely on a lot of conservative values to address the problem. I mean, if you think about it, it's not using the heavy hand of government to pick winners and losers. It's basically turning it over to the market and letting individual consumers and industry leaders um, incent, uh, uh, innovate to try to, to try to move away from their emissions. It's basically bringing the economic externality of carbon emissions into the system. So um, it, we're very ex excited the fact that the Republicans are beginning to support this, and that's why we have this bipartisan bill. And we're particularly um, focused on, of course, uh, Senator Collins and Angus King, uh, uh, Senator King, um, because they are uh, business friendly track record and Senator Collins actually supported something very similar to this 12 years ago um, and we're hoping that she can be convinced to support this as well. Um, this is a document that was published in the Wall Street Journal along with many other um, sources but it's basically a resolution showing that this means pricing carbon giving that money back to each consumer, uh, uh, you know, a gradually increasing price on carbon that the money is returned to each consumer. And the dividend check is supported by over 3,500 economists. I think it's 3,589 right now, all living Fed chair, Federal Reserve chairman, 27 Nobel laureate economists. We have 23, I believe, in the state of Maine, not Nobel laureates, but economists from Maine universities, all of who have signed this document. And this is it's very hard for you to get economists to agree on much, but they all agree that the effective and the effectiveness and the equitability of this policy is um, is the way the most important first step we need to to address um, our carbon emissions. Um, this is us thanking my this is my daughter thanking Shelley Pingree for when she became a co-sponsor um, in summer of 2019. This is us meeting with Angus King back when we could do in-person meetings, and we hope to again sometime soon. And this is us meeting with. Susan Collins. Um, we also meet with uh, Jared Golden, and there are chapters throughout the country where we, I think we've met with all but four of the House and Senate seats. Um, the, I talked to one of the economists who mentioned that they signed on to this, and they said, not only is the science of climate change kind of decided about 30 years ago, and we're just kind of figuring out the details since then, the economics of how best to address this has been settled pretty much the past 15 years ago, from 15 years ago. Um, and so we're just everything other, because this system of pricing carbon works economy wide, uh, we don't have to worry about surprising emissions coming from other sources um, that we're not anticipating. Uh, you know, the other policy is we've been playing whack-a-mole where we're trying to solve a problem in one area and not addressing it in another. And this is the only thing that works economy wide and takes care of the poor. Um, I'm almost done with the slideshow, I promise, but this is the 
a map of the world showing the past 100 years of carbon emissions. So the United States is the big culprit, uh, followed by Europe and Russia and China, um, and the developing world not as much. And then climate change deaths per year. This is kind of just speaking to the moral imperative of doing something about this. This is from Catherine Hayhoe's um, very important work on the morality of climate change. Um, and she's, uh, you know, you, she can see here that we're now averaging about 150,000 deaths per year from extreme weather events, drought, floods, um, extreme heat. Uh, and of course, it's affecting the part of the world that has the least to do with creating the problem, right? Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, just talking about the moral mandate. Um, this is a slide showing some of the organizations, not all, but who have endorsed um, this. And just like the group of economists who have endorsed this idea, this is, you know, we have far left groups, we have far right groups, we have very moderate groups outdoors groups, faith organizations, business friendly groups like chambers of commerces, um, Rotarians, all that kind of stuff, uh, business and community leaders. And then this is a picture of us, of some of our young people leading a meeting with Shelley Pingree, after which she became one of the co-sponsors. And I'll leave this part of the demonstration with this uh, picture of us last time, I think maybe spring of 2019, when we were in uh, doing our Capitol Hill visits with our volunteers. Um, and I'll leave you with this quote with James Hansen, the climate scientist who in 1989 had the first session, a uh, uh, joint session of Congress where he was talking about the perils of climate change. And um, he has this to say about Citizens Climate Lobby and the important work we do. It's the most impressive is the work of Citizens Climate Lobby. If you want to join the fight to save the planet, to save creation for your grandchildren, there is no more effective step you can take than becoming an active member of this group. Um, so if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. That's why I spend so many volunteer hours working on this. James Hansen, um, you know, when he was talking about this a couple of years later under George H.W. Bush in 1991, they, we came inches from putting a cap and trade uh, um, carbon market in place, different, specifics, but it's a form of carbon pricing in a way. Um, and at the last minute, we were, he, there's a bunch of different political reasons, but basically he stepped away from doing that in 1991. And just to bring home the severity of the problem, if you were to calculate all of the carbon emissions before that time to the point of that decision to not go, go ahead with carbon pricing, uh, it would actually be less than the amount of carbon emissions from that decision till now. We've more than doubled the problem. So it puts it into perspective and just shows how important it is. Now, the with our senators, Senators King and Collins, the two of them, we're the only state, even with only 100, oh, sorry, 1.2 million citizens in Maine, 1.3 maybe, I can't remember now. Um, we're a small state, but both of our senators, we're the only state with both senators on these, Bipartisan Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. We know that that group uh, uh, has been using En-ROADS model to judge where the best mechanisms are for addressing climate change. And we also know that they are interested in things that can get bipartisan support so they can be politically robust. So if you want uh, to learn more about this, I encourage you to check out Citizens Climate Lobby. We have a dozen chapters in Maine um, or if you want to learn more about En-ROADS, you feel free to click on this site. You can do the training by clicking right here. And most importantly, if you want to support the bipartisan, um, most important, the, the most important first step of the bill as it reads right now is the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act. You can read about all the support it's, it shares. Um, and if you're a community leader or if you know of any organizations, I'd be happy to make a demonstration to them. But most importantly, you can endorse the bill. It takes about 20 seconds as an organization or as an individual. Or feel free to send us any questions. So you may ask as a Mainer, what can we do? Um, well, as, a, as I said um, it earlier, that the, uh, the fact that we are Mainers actually helps our political clout because we are the only state with both senators on the Senate, bipartisan, uh, the, the Senate, the Bipartisan Senate Climate Solutions Caucus.
So we should be watching carefully what both Senator King and Senator Collins do. They have uh, both they both have pretty admirable uh, track records for the environment. Um, and uh, you know it's debatable certain policy decisions, but Senator Collins's clear act from 2009 was in a way ahead of its time in that in similar to the carbon uh, the carbon pricing that we're talking about, that was a cap in dividend as opposed to a fee in dividend. So in some ways it's actually more, Senator Collins came up with something that's more progressive. It was an artificial cap. We're stopping our emissions here and we're gonna lower it over the years. And that the money that comes from that is a dividend which is very similar to what we're doing, except we're talking about just putting a fee that's gradually increasing instead of a cap. So um, there's all kinds of a political history to that, but basically keeping an eye on what they do is super important. Now, what can you do on a local level? What can you do as a, you know, just a common Mainer who's worried about this, who's sad about the fact that we can't get Maine shrimp and is gonna be sad, you know, in the projected, decades when we lose lobster, blueberries, skiing, and all the other things that we associate with Maine. Um, talk about one thing is to share the importance of carbon pricing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, Citizens Climate Lobby didn't start with carbon pricing. It basically started with an idea that we have to have it be effective. Uh, whatever policy we're talking about has to be effective in, re in reducing the risk of this crisis, climate crisis. And it has to be equitable. It has to take care of the poorest. And they settled on this because it does an added bonus. It's both effective and takes care of the poorest by giving that, that money projects to go down to, to the poorest and middle income folks. It also does a tremendous amount um, to have it be bipartisan. The fact that it does get bipartisan support makes it more politically robust. So that it'd be great to get something that passes um, and, uh, and exists for a couple of years, but if it's not getting some buy-in from both sides of the political aisle, then it is unlikely to last very long. Just think about the fights that have happened over the Affordable Care Act, which was a Republican idea that was fed, you know, that was championed on one side, not to get too political, but um, so that's one thing. On a local level, we are motiv motivated to meet with as many political uh, community leaders as possible. That means businesses who could speak to our representation, uh, community leaders like Rotarians, Lions Clubs, The Works, um, faith organizations, chambers of commerce, whatever it might be, school groups, municipalities. So now we're to talk about politics. There are many, Portland, we're very blessed to have One Climate Future, to have, uh, you know, Portland and South Portland both have a sustainability director, um, Julie Rosenbach in South Portland, Troy Moon in Maine, both of them are doing great work. Both city councils are, are really on the forefront of this. Um, and they, a lot of uh, towns in Maine are declaring climate emergencies. We also have the city of Portland, city of South Portland, and eight or maybe 10 uh, other towns have endorsed carbon pricing on a national level. If you think about all the work that's been doing in a city's wide level, regional level, and even state level, let's talk about the state. Governor Mills should be applauded for making this kind of a centerpiece of her administration. And Hannah Pinger should be applauded for fronting the um, the uh, governor's uh, climate council. However, Maine has 0.32% of the U.S. carbon emissions. So even if we were tremendously, you know, like perfectly successful and we flipped the switch and Maine could turn off of all of its carbon emissions tomorrow, we are still goners because it's, that's, you know, it, that's 0.32%. That doesn't apply to the other 99. Um, seven percent, right? So, what are we going to do about that? We need something. We're not going to get there with just a piecemeal thing, state by state. We're doing what we can, and the more states that do this, the more pressure there is on the federal government. But we need robust national policy, and the fact that the national policy has actually got an international component because of that border adjustment fee I was talking about, it makes it so that that policy, because America is still a, a big power broker on the on the economic scale we are exporting that policy to the rest of the world, the few parts of the world that don't already have that policy, like not Canada, US, uh, or sorry, EU, China. So we need to talk to people in the local level. We need to talk to your state representatives. We're hoping to pass a state, it would be great to pass a state resolution in Augusta, supporting basically a document saying we want our national representatives to work towards this equitable 
uh, carbon pricing model. Um, so those are all the things that need to happen. Uh, Columbia science guru um, and economics of, uh, he's like kind of a uh, authority on the economics of climate change and climate change solutions. Noah um, Kaufman had said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact quote, but it's basically saying, with a gradually increasing price on carbon, there is a possibility we will avert disaster. Um, without it, we are doomed to failure. So we need to have this as part of the, the portfolio at least. And it's the important complementary part to all the important, the great work that's going on in battery storage and all the other things that, uh, and the work that the Maine Climate Council is doing and the other work that King and Collins are finding possible in the divided government to do. Municipalities, so Portland and South Portland and a few others are coming online. Uh, we know um, smaller towns, bigger towns, uh, Bangor, they've all basically passed a city resolution supporting a national carbon fee and dividend. The, the, the policy is called carbon fee and dividend. Fee on carbon, it's not a tax technically because that money, it never actually goes into the IRS's accounts. It goes into a separate escrow account that is mandated to be paid out in full every month. So there's no pot of money that is attractive for politicians to raid for some other purpose, whether that be um, energy investments or plugging a hole in social security or, you know, um, or incentivizing uh, green technology. It's just, there's this money has got to be, the reason why all the money is returned back to the policy, and, and you could be disappointed by that not being applied to the best efforts, but if we don't turn all that money back, that reduces from that 60-70% level of people who benefit, it's going to go down, 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 but the more we kind of skim the cream off the top of that policy. So carbon fee and dividend is what the policy is called, and all those seven different bills are technically that. Uh, the the bill itself, as it appeared in the House in bipartisan and briefly in the Senate when we had a a, a bipartisan bill in the Senate, um, it's the first bipartisan bicameral bill in over 12 years. Um, that was called the Energy Innovation Carbon Dividend Act, which is um, which you know I can show that website that I was showing you right here that I'm asking for an endorsement. Who knows what it's going to be called in the next legislative session, but it's probably something similar. HR 763. Um, the easier way to think about it, and then probably an easier expression, is carbon cash back. A lot of the municipalities in Maine are passing, and we're having a big push coming 2021, to push more towns to adopt a carbon cash back uh, resolution. And we're doing the same thing in the state house and the state senate. Um, and carbon cashback makes a lot of sense. People don't know what dividend checks are unless you're in, you know, playing with stock market and you have those kinds of means. But cashback, that makes sense. I'm going to have a carbon price going up. I'm going to be incentivizing to, to, to move away from that or to, to, to be thriftier with my carbon fees. But it's the cashback part that mostly benefits and translates and also like makes a lot of sense for folks who are on the bottom or middle income. So that's really what it boils down to is the more we can talk about this with our friends and family and people of import that we might know in Maine, the more business leaders, the more folks that we can get to talk about this to their state representatives and senators, and most importantly, our national state representatives and senators.